welcome to the Blindfold Chess Podcast. This week, I wanted to look at a relatively new branch of chess, chess computers. The first quote-unquote chess machine was built in 1770 and was called the Mechanical Turk. The supposed machine would play challengers with various indications that it was a functional machine. In reality, a human operated the machine using the Turk as a sophisticated marionette. You have to jump almost 150 years in the future for the first verified chess computer. El Ahadradista, in 1912, was capable of playing rook and king versus king and games, winning every time, as well as identifying illegal moves. In the 1950s, you start seeing the boom of chess computing, morphing machines into what we're seeing today. In 1951, the Turochamp was invented by Alan Turing and David Champernowny. The two of them helped create the first chess playing algorithm. Turochamp had a built in value of pieces, where a pawn was worth one and a queen worth ten and it could see slash understand undefended pieces, captures and recaptures, piece mobility, and other factors. It would calculate which move it could do that would have the best internal score, then compare that to what the lowest opponent response would be. It would aggregate all these moves together to determine what move it should do. This is called the Minimax algorithm, and they were putting it into action. However, the computer was not strong enough to complete the algorithm in its entirety, so it needed to be manually executed after each move. You have to move forward six years to 1957, where an IBM engineer, Alex Bernstein, successfully created the world's first fully automated chess engine. It took eight minutes per move, but it could play an entire game, marking the official beginning of chess computing. The computer ran on a memory of 70 kilobytes, processing 42,000 instructions per second. The next year, in 1958, the NSS computer was the first to beat a human player. The human player was a secretary of one of the engineers who learned to play chess one hour before the match. Almost a decade later, in 1966, the Mac Hack 6 from MIT was the first computer to play in a tournament. It had one draw and four losses for a 1243 US chess rating. The next year, that computer was able to beat a rated chess player for the first time. That player was rated 1510 in US chess rating. In 1970, the first all computer championship was won by Chess 3.0 with six other computers competing. In 1977, Chess 4.5 won the Minnesota Open with a performance rating of 2271. At the time, computers were participating in tournaments against humans. This tournament saw a computer beat a Class A player, which is rated above 2000 US Chess, for the first time. In 1981, the computer Cray Blitz went 5-0 in the Mississippi State Championship with a performance rating of 22.58, and in round 4, Cray Blitz beat a 22.60 rated master. This was the first computer to beat a master and obtain a master rating. In 1985, the computer Deep Thought began development. Three years later, Deep Thought shared first place at the U.S. Open with a performance rating of 2745. Ben Larson became the first grandmaster to lose to a computer. Deep Thought was not at the world championship level yet as it lost a two game match against the then world champion Gary Kasparov, but it could still study two million positions a second. That is where we're going to have our first stop of the day. We're going to look at a game of Deep Thought played in 1992 during a rapid match. Deep Thought 
versus Grandmaster David Bronstein. Now, if we're ready, let's begin. One pawn to e4. Pawn to e5. Two pawn to f4. Pawn e captures f4. Three knight f3. Pawn to g5. 4. Pawn to h4. Pawn to g4. 5. Knight e5. Bishop e7. 6. Queen captures g4. Pawn to d6. With the move pawn to d6, what piece or pieces are under attack on white's side? That would be the queen on g4 from the newly opened bishop on c8, as well as the knight on e5 from the pawn on d6. Seven, queen g7. White responds by making two threats of its own. What is white threatening? That would be the rook on h8, as well as checkmate on f7. Pawn d captures e5. Eight, queen captures h8. Bishop captures h for check. Nine, king d1. Bishop g for check. Ten, bishop e2. Bishop captures e2 check. Eleven, king captures e2. Queen g5. Twelve, king f1. Pawn to f3. Thirteen, pawn g captures f3. Queen g3. The only developed piece for white is the queen on h8. White is currently up in exchange, but black is threatening checkmate on f2. How would you stop the checkmate threat? Fourteen, rook captures h4. Queen captures f3 check. Fifteen, king e1. Queen g3 check. Sixteen, king e2. Knight c6. Seventeen, pawn to c3. The white rook is currently attack on h4. Why did white choose to play the move c3 
instead of moving the rook to safety. Playing pawn to c3 blocks the black knight on c6 from entering the position, as well as giving white some escape squares for his king by either going to d3 and then c2, or d1 and then c2. Whereas if white were to have moved the rook, the knight would have infiltrated the position, and the knight and queen for black would have been a deadly combination for white. Queen captures h4. A teen, queen captures g8 check. King d7. Nineteen, queen captures a8. Queen g4 check. Twenty, king d3. Pawn to f5. Twenty one, king c2. Black resigns. Being up a rook and a piece with only a couple of spite checks to show for it, Deep Thought came away with the victory. The computer Deep Thought was later renamed to Deep Blue by IBM. The computer was prototyped in 1995 and was released in 1996. The computer was capable of calculating 2 to 2.5 million positions per second using 1 gig of RAM and 4 gigs of disk space. In its first match against Garry Kasparov, it won Game 1 becoming the first computer to defeat a world champion under classic tournament settings. Kasparov then rallied and won the match 4-2. The following year, Deep Blue rematched Garry Kasparov. In that one year, it doubled the number of chess chips and increased the computing power to 100 to 200 million chess positions processed in one second. That is where we are looking at our second game of the day, the Man vs. Machine Championship of 1997. Deep Blue vs. Garry Kasparov in round six. Now, if we're ready, let's begin. 1. Pawn to e4. Pawn to c6. 2. Pawn to d4. Pawn to d5. 3. Knight c3. Pawn d captures e4. 4. Knight captures e4. Knight d7. Playing knight to d7 enters black into either the Semislav variation or the Karpov variation of the Karokhan. Both are well-known world champions. This is a very solid line with the idea of exchanging a pair of knights for black without sacrificing pawn structure integrity. However, this type of opening can lead to struggles for black in protecting the f7 square. 5. Knight g5. Knight g to f6. 6. Bishop d3. Pawn to e6. 7. Knight 1 to f3. Pawn to h6. 6. In an effort to alleviate the pressure on black's king side, 
Black made a mistake in playing pawn to h6. While it does attack the knight on g5, it gives up the light square of g6, allowing deep blue opportunities to attack the light squares of e6, f7, and g6. Eight, knight captures e6. Queen e7. Nine, castle kingside. Pawn f captures e6. Ten, bishop g6 check. King d8. Eleven, bishop f4. Why did white choose to place the bishop on f4 compared to any other square on the diagonal? Putting the bishop on f4 allows white to deter black from playing pawn to e5, which could help loosen up black's position. The bishop on f4 also prevents black from giving the king any squares to run to, now that c7 and b8 are covered by the bishop. Pawn to b5. Twelve, pawn to a four. Bishop b seven. Thirteen, rook e one. Knight d five. Fourteen. Bishop g3. King c8. Fifteen. Pawn a captures b5. Pawn c captures b5. Sixteen. Queen d3. Bishop c6. 17. Bishop f5. White is continuing to apply pressure on the light squares of the position by using the pin of the pawn on e6 for the bishop on f5 to x-ray the king on c8. What major pieces are on the e-file that would be the white rook on e1 which is pinning the pawn on e6 to the queen on e7 pawn e captures f5 18 rook captures e7 Bishop captures e7. Nineteen, pawn to c4. Black resigns. With black being down a queen, a very exposed king, and no hope for a counterattack, Kasparov resigned to deep blue here. Deep Blue went on to win the match 3.5 to 2.5, asserting the computer's domination over humans in chess that has not been relinquished. After the turn of the millennium in 2003, there were seven computers rated above Super Grandmaster level at 2700, led by Shredder 7.04, performing at a 2810 rating. 
In 2017, AlphaZero entered the picture and gained a lot of attention for its self-teaching methods of shogi, go, and chess. AlphaZero was trained on chess for nine hours using Google's supercomputer. In those nine hours, it played itself 44 million times before playing against a match against the then top chess engine, Stockfish 8. AlphaZero won with 28 games, drew 72, and losing none. Fast forward to today, in 2024, the highest rated computer is Stockfish, with an estimated rating of 3632 as of February of 2024. For reference, the highest rated human is 2882. It is incredible to see computers continue to climb. We no longer have an ego in the discussion of who is stronger, humans or engines. We use engines every day for learning, analysis, and personal improvement. And engines also act as a great tool to help teach people outside of chess on how to read a position without knowing anything about the game itself. Engines have helped elevate the game far beyond what humans could have, and we still have so much more to learn. After that crash course through history, that is all that we have for this week. Tune in next time, where we will look at another chess game and continue to work on our blindfold skills.